Hey everyone, welcome back to Brian's Mysteries and Adventures on Trail. I hope everyone's doing well. Real quick, I just wanted to thank you all for all your support, all those for subscribing. If you haven't subscribed, it's free. I'd really appreciate it if you consider it. If you have any case suggestions, I always try and cover all the cases that you guys suggest. I'll have more information on various things at the end of this video if you'd like to stay tuned for that. I also wanted to say thank you for all of you that have sent thoughts and prayers with my family going through such a hard time right now. I appreciate it. My family appreciate it. And it's just so nice feeling all the love and support from all of you. So thank you very much for that. Today's case, we're going to be talking about a gentleman by the name of David Boomhauer. Now, this case takes us all the way back to 1990. But I wanted to talk about it for several reasons. There isn't a lot of information on this case, just on the basic internet. Most of the information that I found, I found in old newspaper articles. Once I got into the articles, I found a lot of different information. David was 38 years old at the time, living in Latham, which is a suburb of Albany, New York. I'm going to have various maps up and descriptions to give you the best idea of where all this took place. He was a post office worker. He was going through relationship issues. Unfortunately, his wife was having an affair with his best friend. And for whatever reason, they were all living in the same house at this time. Eventually, poor David had to move out because obviously he wasn't going to live there while his wife was having an affair with his best friend. They ended up having different arguments, getting a divorce. David, though, he took this in stride. He didn't like fall off the deep end. He decided that he was going to try and do a through hike of the Northfield Placid Trail. He started working out very hardcore, doing pull-ups, going to the gym. He met some other friends that were possibly going to train or were looking to do a through hike. So he started running. He was running several miles every day just got into absolutely amazing shape. Now this was all leading up to June 5th was when he wanted to start his through hike, 132 mile hike, which he was going to try and finish by June 15th of 1990. This particular hike starts in Northville, New York and ends in the town of Lake Placid. I'm going to have some pictures of the various towns and the trail just to give you an idea of this particular ta trail is considered very rugged. It's very remote. This is the actually only picture that I could find of Dave who went by Uncle Dave. Apparently was a very, very nice, well-known man, well-respected. These towns are very small. They're very quaint. They're very beautiful and they are a tourist attraction in some areas however this trail is considered very difficult here is a picture of one of the lakes where the Northville Placid Trailhead starts the way this trail is the first several miles of it are actually a road walk a lot of people especially through hikers don't like doing road walks personally I don't mind them as long as it's not a crazy busy highway in any event he started at the Benson Road Trailhead, which he was basically just bypassing the road walk by doing that. Here's some maps of that area. On his first day, he did roughly nine miles and he went to a place called the Silver Lake Lean-To. There's different lean-tos in the area where you can seek shelter. The hike seemed to be going well. Uh, David seemed to be doing okay. We know this because David kept a journal throughout his hike. By day number three, he was hiking through the town of Pisco, New York. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. There was a local post office there. He stopped at this local post office so that he could mail his sister a postcard. By day number four, David had entered what is known as the West Canada Lakes Wilderness. According to hikers and people that have hiked and been in this area, it is extremely remote. It is extremely rugged. It is a very difficult area to hike. There are a lot of swampy, marshy areas. The trail can be wet and damp in a lot of parts. It's just a very treacherous area of the trail. 
It was on June 8th where he was in this wilderness around the Cedar Lakes area and he met a man named Paul Wilbur, just another man who was out very familiar with these particular areas and these lakes. He was out fishing. The two men had a small interaction, according to Mr. Wilbur. They just talked for a few minutes. He said that David seemed okay. He did say that David seemed a little bit disheveled. His gear didn't seem to be packed properly. However, it wasn't enough to make him feel concerned that, you know, David was injured or anything. He was smiling. They had a nice conversation and David went on his way. Sadly, though, that was the last person that ever saw David. By June 17th, two days after his intended arrival date, he had not gotten to Lake Placid, so his families immediately contacted Search and Rescue. The Search and Rescue started looking through the logbooks. On a lot of these trails, especially the bigger ones, they have logbooks, they're register books. Back then in the 1990s, I'm sure they were in a lot better shape. I, they have them on the PCT. I know from my experience, they're very beat up. A lot of times they're illegible or just people haven't closed the lid properly. In any event, because he was so fastidious about signing these logbooks, the search and rescue teams were able to track him all the way to an area known as West Lake. But unfortunately, that was his last entry. After that, they had no more clues as to where he may have gone or where he was at the time. This was only a few days after he had intended to arrive at his destination. So the search and rescue teams had very high hopes. They knew that he had plenty of overnight gear, food and water with him. They continued their search and focused it around the Cedar Lake areas and the Cedar River flow. I'm going to have different maps up here as well. There's another trail called the Sucker Brook Trailhead that's important. I'll go over that here in a few minutes. This is a newspaper article showing two park rangers searching uh, the Cedar River, John Chambers and Jeremy Mannell. This official search and rescue continued until July 9th of 1990, which is a pretty long search considering that usually most searches only last about 10 days. Of course, the family wasn't ready to give up. They kept on searching for another month. The Department of Environmental Conservation, or DEC, also helped the family. They volunteered a helicopter at one point. They helped search the Cedar Lake Dam area near Indian Lake. Sadly, though, after months of searching, they just lost hope and they had no clues to go on. Until October 20th of that year, 1990, when the local hunting season had began and two hunters were going out for a hunt starting around the Louis Lake area, heading west on the Sucker Brook Trail that I mentioned earlier. Now I'm going to have some maps up to give you an idea of where all this was. They were in this area around Louis Lake when one of the gentlemen named Donald Major, who was 61 years old at the time, he came across what he thought looked like a red sweater or shirt hung on a stick. As he approached it closer, he could tell it was a postal, U.S. postal worker's shirt. He then found a green tent that was all sort of smushed down with the word help written on it. He knew something bad had happened. At this point, he hadn't found anything else, just these two things. They then hiked up a little bit more of Cellar Mountain. This is where they found the remains of David. He was sadly lying face down in a body of water under two trees that had fallen. Mr. Major and his fellow hiker, they were both well aware of this missing hiker. This had been one of the biggest searches in the Antarctic's history in over 15 years. Roughly 200 rangers and various volunteers and policemen took place in this search. When the police got there, they found David Boomhauer's journal, 
which then led them to more information of what happened to this poor man. At first I was a little confused because the information, if you do a Google search, it just says that they thought he drowned or maybe hit his head. Those same reports though also said that he had no broken bones and no sign of injuries. So it just didn't quite make sense to me until I read more research and I read more about what he wrote in his journal then it all started coming together i'm going to have a little excerpt from what he wrote in his journal right here on one of the first days of his hike he'd become so thirsty that he just used one of his cups to grab some water from one of the creeks sadly because the water wasn't filtered he contracted what is known as beaver fever or that's what they used to call it now people on trail usually just call it giardia for those of you that don't know, Giardia is a parasite bacteria that you can get from drinking unfiltered water. Every year that I've gone out west, I've run into a group of hikers where one of them or somebody that they knew has gotten it from not filtering their water properly. So one of my reasons for doing this is I want to make sure that no matter how nice the water looks, no matter what elevation the water is, I highly recommend you always filter your water. I'm going to have some examples of different water filters. There's so many options out there. There is the very, very popular Sawyer Squeeze, which is pictured right here. It's probably the most common filter that I see on trail. Just remember if you're carrying any type of filter like this, if you're camping in cold weather, you need to sleep with the filter in your sleeping bag, in your jacket, and keep it warm. Once those filter particles freeze, they're no longer work. I also carry Aquamarina drops in my fanny pack as a backup just to have in case my filter goes down. The Catadine Be Free is another option that a lot of people seem to love on trail. If you're more for the gravity type system, Life Straw makes them, Platypus makes them. There's just so many different filter options out there. And it's just, in my opinion, always a very good idea to filter your water no matter where you are. And you always want to make sure too when you're filtering when you're taking the dirty water and putting filter into the new bottle you want to dry off the dirty water bottle first because even just a few drops of the bad water that can fall into the good water can be contaminated with giardia and believe me you do not want to get giardia on trail it is just awful it gives you terrible diarrhea and other stomach issues and if it goes untreated you just keep getting more and more dehydrated according to his own words in his journal after meeting up with the fisherman he left the main npt trail and he followed the sucker book trail in an eastward direction about a half a mile reaching a lean to where he stayed then he was planning to hike seven miles on the sucker brook trail to Louis Lake campground thinking that he would find other campers and hopefully find a ride out. Sadly though, due to his weakening condition and becoming more dehydrated, when he came to the junction between Cellar and Louis Mountains, he for whatever reason left the main trail and got lost. He was able to find the actual Sucker Brook which he set up his camp next to. Sadly, this was only about a quarter mile away from the actual trail, which had he found would have led him most likely to safety or running into some other hikers or hunters or whoever might have been in the area. From my research, I found that he wrote several times that he was sure that he had Giardia and he wrote this in his journal many times and by the end of these journal entries, he was so disoriented that he thought he had been missing for several months when really it had only been a couple of weeks. The journal entries were very hard to read. It was very sad. You could tell this man was suffering. He was scared. He didn't know what to do. It just must have been awful. The thing is, the autopsy report said that they believed he died from a fall and then drowning. However, like I said earlier, they found no traumatic injuries to his body, no broken bones, there was no water in his lungs. 
based on what he wrote in his journal, I believe the catalyst for this all starting was when he contracted Giardia and things just went downhill from there. It's like anything else. Some people don't feel the effects of it for several weeks. Some people get sick within a couple of days. Some people get over it right away. Some people have problems for years. Over the last five years out west, I've seen it knock dozens of hikers off trail. It's of course treatable with medication, but sometimes when you're away from your hometown, it's hard to get a doctor's appointment. My point is just, I always advise people to filter their water. My thoughts and prayers go out to David Boomhauer, his whole family, his friends, everyone who helped look for him, the thousands of hours of manpower that went into finding him, the two hunters that helped bring him back to his family and helped bring them closure. I want to thank you all for watching, as always. Special thank you to co.ag for providing the background music. Hopefully I will see you all in the next one. Take care. Hey everyone, thanks for sticking with me to the end. This is definitely a very sad, tragic case. If you would like to do further reading on this case or any of my cases, I always have all my sources in the description. I've talked about newspapers.com before. It's a great, great site. Hundreds and hundreds of digitized newspapers for over 200 years. I have no affiliation or anything with them, but it is a great place to do research if you're interested in doing more reading on various cases, I highly recommend checking that out or any other newspaper archive that you might find that you might like. I have several other cases that I'm working on right now. I also wanted to talk about the coin giveaway. So I ran into a little bit of a problem. I had the coin giveaway all set up. I ordered it, it just wouldn't come in. And then I went back to the website and I saw this, this message that said, if you ordered your thing after August 21st, 24th, it won't be shipped until October sometime, which was not there when I placed the order. So I ordered this other coin, which I've also done a giveaway. It's the same exact size. It's just the eagle coin with the horse on it. It's got the case. It's a beautiful coin. I'm going to be doing that drawing this week. I really apologize about that. And then when the other coin comes in, I'll do another drawing for that coin. All you need to do to enter is leave a comment, say you want to be entered into the coin giveaway, maybe a case suggestion, any feedback. It's a beautiful coin. It comes with a COA, the case, nice gift box. I really do apologize about that. I ordered mine, I think, on August 27th, and you know, I still didn't get it. So it's just one of those things. Anyway, I wanted to say thank you for all your support. If you'd like to support the channel, all my information is in the description. I really appreciate anything, a dollar, two dollars, ten dollars, twenty dollars, whatever. Anything you could afford is awesome. It helps. It goes such a long way. Your comments, all your feedback, that's awesome to me. I just can't thank you all enough. Thank you for your support, and I will see you next time. Take care.